The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Might as well get started. Um, so this is sort of carrying on the conversation that we had last time. We talked about, you know, uh, is it the case that um, you know con countries have, um, for possibly for very long-term historical reasons, some countries might have very different kinds of institutions from others. In particular, well, some might be much worse than others. Uh, in at least in as using the standard measures, and then what do you do about it? And sort of the first reaction is sometimes, well, tough, right? You know, if the story is that you had had to have some some lucky break 400 years ago to get get the institutions right, then it's it's not entirely clear that there's much you can do about it. That's sort of the pessimistic view. Now. There's the people, so, so this, is, this is for the people who really worry about these issues, um, there's an interesting debate going on where there are really, the, it's really between these four, four people listed or five people listed above uh, are on the two sides of the debate. Um, one side of it is a, a Stanford professor called Paul Romer who, who's has come up with this idea of charter cities, like charter schools. So he, he wants, um, if you like, to import institutions. So his basic idea is the US has good institutions. So a US firm or a US NGO would start, you know, if uh, South Sudan wants to have a city, then they should just kind of hire a US firm to set up the city for them have the same guarantees that the U.S. has, so it will be a part of the um, part of the U.S. Um, institutional frame. Uh, that's a so it's not clear exactly how that works because, um, for example, uh, suppose uh, you know you set up a court in that country and it is under your has the U.S. laws, but the judge in the court uh, decides not to implement those laws. Uh, does the U.S. invade? Uh, who's making the commitment? So this, this is a, a set of real issues about you know how you get that to work. Yeah. Isn't it more fundamental issues of like what foreign country would be willing to sponsor a charter city? Because seemingly all the men, even if you could find a country to like host it, like a country that you want to go to land. The outside, the outside, let's say, sponsor, for lack of a better term, at least the way where you guys talk about the book, like they basically give it up as soon as the city's like kind of successful. I mean, it kind of alludes to Hong Kong being an example, but Hong Kong in very different circumstances under which why, like, because Britain originally like um, like colonized it in the hopes of having it as its own and having it as a commercial center, and then they got the benefits for like a hundred years before they handed it over. And, uh, and uh, equally importantly, they handed it over to under circumstances when they really didn't have any choice. I mean, uh, so um, being um, Britain is certainly in no position to, um, let's say, uh, disagree with China on a, about a city that's next to us to China. So there was no. There was, there was no leverage there whatsoever. So yeah, so there's several issues there. You just brought up one, which is how do I make the kind of the, if you like, there's a, to use your word, the sponsoring country give up the city. Then there's the opposite problem. How do I um, make sure the city actually runs? I mean, who, who, who's guaranteeing it? I mean, you know, is it the case that um, suppose the, uh, Suppose the judge uh, in who is supposed to enforce, you know, U.S. laws in I don't know uh, Benin um, 
is, uh, doesn't do it, who's going to be the, who's, who's liable to, to make it happen? Yeah. Right, so. So in the same way as like colonies that um, uh, where Europeans did not settle permanently in the Western world, they set up and started the institutions. That would be a different view. So, so, so you're right. I mean, there's a question of the demand side for it. Maybe no, uh, there's no country that wants it. But let's say that there is, I think. Paul's presumption is that there are countries that would like to have better institutions. They cannot domestically manufacture it, but if some, if they just somehow imported institutions and there was a guarantee behind it, then it would work. So you're, you're pointing to a, a, a completely, I mean, it's, what you're saying is completely right. There needs to be a demand for it. If the country doesn't want it, it's never going to happen. But let's say the country even wants these institutions. I think that even, even in that case, there are several problems. One is how do you actually run a charter city? I mean, who, who's, in, who's in charge? Uh, and um, is it the case that suppose, uh, you know, is, is the US prepared to back up its whatever, its uh, commitment to the char charter city? If it says the US laws, does that mean the US is going to send in an army whenever the laws are violated? There's, Right, exactly. So, who, what's the commitment the to it? So, absolutely. So, okay. all forms of commitment are a, an issue, obviously. You know, it, it's not enough to say that we have US style laws. In fact, if you look at across the world, laws don't vary a lot. Uh, what va varies, our legal systems vary relatively little. Uh, what varies is the enforcement of the laws. So, you have to make sure who's watching that the laws are getting enforced. Yeah, Melissa. So it's like a hotel. It's like a privatized but government. Yeah, it's like a large so it's a, hotel. It's, a hotel. it's like larger than a hotel. But a, but a large hotel. Like you know, some yeah, hotels have have, like have their internal currency. I was once in, trapped into this completely horrible hotel, which had this internal currency <laughs> with high inflation, as far as I could tell. <laughs> because whenever I wanted to buy something, so basically you go into the hotel. It's like a resort, and you can spend the. the they give you a certain amount of currency and you can spend it anywhere you want in the resort. But it turns out that the prices are extraordinarily high. <laughs> so, so there was, there was this, so th that's sort of the same idea. I mean, it's, like, it's quite different, but it, like, I guess it, it's just that we don't really have anything like on a smaller scale than this that we could even say, like, does it work on a smaller scale? A so why is it different scale? from a hotel where you, a resort where you can go from like one shop to another and their shops are competing. Why is it different? I mean, because at least like one thing that's different is there's like a, a, like a major industry there that, that creates demand. Whereas if you set some city up in like the middle of Africa, like where there's not already an economic industry. Never right. So, so part, part of it is that there is an economic engine that's, that's already there. And that, so you're saying, then there's a chicken and egg problem, which is that the city will only generate value if it is it comes with an economic model, and the economic model isn't there already. If you just guarantee the institutions, how good does the guarantee need to be before the economic engine arrives? That's sort of a, a challenge. That right? you might imagine that the problem it might be that if I tell you that you know I'm in Cote d'Ivoire in the middle of the civil war, but we have this enclave that's protected. You really need very good assurances of protection before some industry is going to be willing to move, move to this enclave in Cote d'Ivoire in the middle of the civil war. So you, you're always, 
this question of who guarantees. But also, I think there is the question, a third question, which is what's to stop the country from withdrawing its um, concession. So let's say the country gave you some land, you build a lot of buildings, you got a few factories running there, what's to stop a country with bad institutions from coming back the next year and saying, well, now that we have all these factories, I want them. And who's going to stop that? Would the US send in an army to stop that? They seem like there are myriad issues of implementation which seem makes this a rather wacky scheme. Yeah. Yeah, the same thing could also affect economics if you affect the rest of the country. You're going to build a whole new city out of scratch and make all that economic activities centered there. And all the existing cities and things surrounding that will not necessarily be affected. Yeah. Yeah, that too. Just, you know, what what is the you know, how do you deal with the inequality and all that within the country, yeah. So when Paul Rohan proposed this, it sounds like very theoretical. I don't think he actually proposed how to implement it, but uh, did he mention the timeline for the cities? Because although you might have the framework for good institutions, you might have all the laws, you still need the people to implement it, people to respect it. And that's somewhat a cultural issue that if you grew up in a corrupt society, you have it kind of ingrained in you how to go about things. So it would take uh, gen at least one generation or several generations to get people to change their ways and actually uh, follow the law and uh, help make this, these institutions work. For example, kind of Russia transiting from uh, the communist society to democracy, they have all the laws and all the rules and all the institutions, but people still have this old uh, mindset that's not uh, working. Uh, so that, that, I think that's, that, that goes back to the first point we, we were saying, which is that the evidence on institutions is, says that if you got the right accident which made your institutions the right ones you know, 200 or 400 years ago, then that persists. Um, that doesn't say anything about transplanting institutions, but I think Romer is posing exactly, he's asking the right question which is imagine that the US has good institutions. Can a US company set up a, take advantage of the fact that it's a US company and US has good institutions to set up a, a, a kind of a charter city in Cote d'Ivoire which will have good institutions. So he's kind of exactly, he's thought about this issue. He thinks that, well, the way you do it is you import institutions. That's, that's the idea. And so in some sense, you're totally right that you know, it's not, it's not enough to just write down the rules of the institutions, and that's completely right. But he's, he's not saying that. He's saying that plus implementation will come from U.S. company. The question is whether U.S. company can implement anything like that. Yeah. Could it some degree, like, uh, I mean, it would be interesting to see in 20 or 30 years what Afghanistan and Iraq is like. I mean, obviously they have three existing populations, but to some degree, the closest thing to what Romer suggesting, we're kind of seeing in action. I mean, in Iraq, I mean, the level of U.S. monetary involvement has been huge. I mean, they take out about military expenses, and they're trying to create these new institutions. So it'll be interesting to see, I mean, that could be an interesting example case to kind of build off of in the future when kind of uh, change in institutions on a wide scale is talking about. I mean, obviously, it's not very sustainable, and I imagine, and there will be a series of issues, but it'll be interesting to well, I mean, this is an aside, but it's worth reading. Um, the book, uh, I think it's called Imperial Life in the Emerald City or something. It's a wonderful book. It's about, it's the Washington Post um, bureau chief in Iraq after a year and a half there wrote this book about uh, the implementation of U.S. institutions in Iraq. Uh, and what was wonderful about the story in that book was, and this is relevant for what we're going to talk about in a bit, so it's not entirely an aside. So the book is wonderful in describing exactly how the U.S. went about institution, you know, implementing good institutions in Iraq. So uh, basically, the rule one was that um, the people who got hired to do that were um, either staffers of prominent uh, Republican uh, congressmen or senators, 
or prominent contributors to the Republican cause. That, those are the only people who were selected. Second, most of the staffers who were given responsibility for, for example, designing the stock market laws were 23 year olds who had uh, a ba background, uh, who had an undergraduate degree in accounting were sent to set up these laws as a result uh, and there was usually one person who had um, you know for example you, you know somebody a 23 year old with an undergraduate degree was assigned to be in charge of setting up uh, the stock market or um, you know figuring out how to uh, you know reform the legal system so these were people with strong background in being um, Republican um, operatives and no background in actually running any institution. So this, this, the book is wonderful in that it sort of goes through how, how the whole process was sort of doomed from the start because the institutions, people who were sent to do these institutions had no competence whatsoever in doing the job because they were all political appointees and um, it's quite actually the the uh, book is actually worth reading and it sort of comes back to a point I'll come back to later which is that you know imagine you wanted to make institutions better you still need competence and it's not just a matter of of having you know some playbook from the US it's a matter of actually having the competence to turn that playbook into reality and uh, I think that, that that's that was part of the a very major problem in Iraq in fact um, but that's not Let's go back to um, the so then there is Paul Collier uh, who be, who has a different view who says and in some ways I think this view I find less unrealistic maybe less defensible but less unrealistic which is you know if the country has really horrible institutions just invade. Um, this is sort of the, this is at least internally coherent, much more I think internally coherent than the Romer suggestion which I don't see how it would be implemented but uh, this one uh, you can imagine at least the policy prescription is simple, invade uh, and then uh, just set up colonial rule for a while. Uh, this has been tried, it's been implemented in the past, we know how to kind of how it's to be done. So there's no implementation problem. You might have various objections to it. I, I think, um, but I, in, in many ways this is, this is a more difficult one to ch challenge on, on uh, purely a priori grounds. I mean one of, the, uh, one of the sad facts is that we know very little about the effect of colonial rule from history. That is to say, if you look at places that didn't get colonized, so few of them didn't get colonized and they're so unique, like China is one country that didn't get colonized. Uh, it's, it's, but if you, basically most poor countries, most countries outside uh, Europe and the North America were colonized. And as a result, there's just very little and when you compare the ones that got colonized with the ones that didn't, the ones that didn't get colonized were like Japan and China and those are not random draws from any population. So you, you, it's very hard to, hard to see what uh, the effect of being colonized is. The one exception to that that I know which is not quite perfect but it does a little bit of that is uh, an MIT PhD student some years ago, Lakshmi Iyer did this paper. Well, what she did is she looked at, in India, um, there was a, what is called the doctrine of lapse. The doctrine of lapse was a beautiful idea. So the way India was colonized was bit by bit. And uh, then the bits that were get, got, some bits got left out at any, any point. They would fight a battle, take over some land, and then some would be left out. And then they'll have a treaty with the local potentate at that time for to set up uh, you know to have a kind of a dependent ruler. So there was a, so basically India uh, in a, basically this process of colonizing India ends in 1857 with a, with 
about two thirds of India under direct British rule and one third of India under rules, rule of a whole bunch of rulers, 500 odd rulers who were each had a little small territory and was the king of that territory and had a treaty with the British. And the British basically were um, kind of overseeing this, this person. So that's how the colonization happened. Now, one of the ways in which the British would take over one of these little kingdoms was under what was called the doctrine of lapse. The doctrine of lapse was a, uh, you know, one might say a cynical idea, but um, it was a, it was the idea that if the king didn't have a natural heir, then the kingdom would lapse to British rule. So uh, you basically what this paper does is she, it is compares places which during, so this doctrine of lapse was basically enforced very heavily for eight years, from 1848 to 1856. During this period, about 20, 20 places had the, um, had the um, sort of the king, king, king die uh, and uh, I guess some of those places had a male natural heir. Natural heir means a, su a son, basically, and the other places didn't. So what she does is she compares the places which had a natural heir with the places which didn't have a natural heir. So if you look at these places, if you think that the birth of a male child is kind of a random accident, then you might say that these are comparable. And on most things, they do look comparable. If you look at these places, 150 years later, the places that were under British rule uh, do worse in almost every attribute that can be measured. They're you know, less good infrastructure, less good education, less good uh, other things. So uh, that's the only piece of evidence I've seen that has some, some bearing on this question. It's still a very special set of, you know, still 20 places. So I would say we, don't, we know very little about the, even the economic effects of colonialism. <laughs> and then there are the, all the political effects, which are that you know, colonists are often, you know, they create hierarchies, and those hierarchies create all kinds of resentment and a whole bunch of stuff, other stuff that um, potentially uh, can go wrong. And I, I, but I don't think there's a great natural experiment that tells you what would have happened had, you know, had um, whatever uh, Algeria not been colonized? I don't think anybody knows the answer. Yeah. Congo, like the U.S. and Canada, have been like colonized, suggests that it matters so much on the nature of it. You know, that why do we why do we want to make a general statement? Oh, I I I guess the question is whether or not you want to interact. Uh, race with with with, uh, with colony, you get much worse outcome. You almost surely do. The question is whether that's interpretable or not. One, if I said that, take take colonies which are non-white colonies, they do a lot worse than white colonies. Now, what that means, I don't know. But that's that's a. But I I I, I do think that if you you could make a firm hypothesis, which which I don't think is testable given the data, that if you were non-white and you were colonized by white people, it, you ended up badly. You could make the hypothesis. It wouldn't be rejected. People in the US who were non-white who were colonized by white people still ended up badly economically relative to yeah. white Americans. Yeah, exactly. So I, I do, I did, I'm not saying that you could resolve this question. Yeah. I'm saying you, but the hypothesis would not be prima facie rejected by the data. Um, but my point is only, the, only that we don't know. I wasn't saying more than that. I would just say that it's not an implausible hypothesis, but one that I think, um, I, I, I don't think we know enough to answer Collier's question. I actually don't think that this is a realistic idea because I don't think anybody's prepared to, to actually, I think if you look at the US, the real problem with getting the US to be a colonist is that the, U, the US actually loves the idea maybe of, you know, being influential in the world, but it doesn't actually like the idea of having young U.S. soldiers fighting to protect 
some foreign land from its own internal conflicts. That just doesn't, is not a politically popular idea. So I don't actually think any country is volunteer to, volunteering to be a colonist. And that might be a good thing, but it is certainly true that I think after the Vietnam War, the US has had enough of, I think, long-term colonialism. I think that's a, that's a, I think that's the given. So I don't think there is any country that's volunteering. So again, I don't think Collier's solution, whether it's right or wrong, I'm inclined to believe it won't work even if you tried, but that's a stat apart. Uh, I don't think there is any evidence that anybody's willing to do it. So it's maybe moot. Um, and then there is uh, Bill Easterly, who's, who's been very critical of both Romer and, um, and Collier. And his position is very, in, uh, I would say, internally consistent. His view is that you really don't, there's nothing you can do to help countries. Countries have to help themselves. There is no, uh, no sense in which there is really any outside wisdom that's useful, with an important caveat I'll come back to in a minute. But therefore, you know, colonialism won't help because it's not countries help themselves. They solve their own problems. You can't really help any, any country. Uh, he's not entirely, he doesn't quite stop there, which would be really internally consistent. Um, whether right or wrong uh, is a different question. He says, except you should have free trade, democracy, and uh, capitalism. Those are the three things that he's in favor of. And then uh, he's not really in favor of anything else. So he, he does believe that those three things can come be, the, the country does not have, should not have choice on those dimensions. But once you have implemented those, you can let them, leave them alone. So he's, now again, the problem is that there is not much evidence. I mean, certainly some countries have figured it out. There's no question. It's not clear that that's, there's a, any evidence that the process of figuring out is a particularly efficient process. That w we've talked a lot through this semester about policies that were, uh, you know, tried and didn't work, and uh, they didn't work for very good reasons. The, this is so. In other words, there is a lot of knowledge out there that's useful for countries who. Uh, countries to use. So it's not clear that you want to take the position that countries need to make every mistake and figure it out. So that there is a, and it's not even clear what a country means. I mean, is, a, is, is it really the case that um, if I think of uh, Tunisia uh, under Ben Ali, that was a, you know, a collective experiment in dictatorship? It doesn't seem like that's the right, right description that, you know, so a country is just a set of people, uh, but uh, it's not clear that there is any organizing body which is implementing a national experiment. I mean, maybe some countries are, but most countries seem to be just, you know, when they fail, they seem to be not doing anything particularly interesting. Some guy is stealing a lot of money and the rest of the rest of the people are suffering. That doesn't seem like uh, necessarily uh, a, a recipe for uh, you know, it's not clear that that's a symptom of the process of figuring out where you're going, rather than just a symptom of failure. Um, and then I think the most internally consistent are definitely our colleagues uh, Asimoglu and Robinson, whose view is very much that there's nothing you can do to help, uh, but also then mostly nothing good will happen. So the, the, their view is, I think, most solidly, I think, internally consistent. You know, basically, countries are probably screwed. Uh, if they and uh, yeah. I don't think that's like a fair assessment. Like Jim Robinson's doing all this stuff in Sierra Leone now with the World Bank. Like, and, uh, yeah, I, I, but I, I know Jim very well. I, I know Jim very well. I think he would say he's a pessimist. Um, he might be trying to do something, but I think he's, well, I, I actually think, I would say that he, the, that's the most in, internally consistent of all these positions that you see is, is the one of saying that, look, you know, if I really believe that institutional changes are very difficult and they only happen because of, you know, major historical events, then it's internally consistent to be pessimistic because, you know, uh, you, why would we, we have much hope? And I think they are, the, the examples they give of 
basically of changes are the French Revolution and the Glorious Revolution. Those are the two examples that they mostly spend a lot of time talking about. Um, the so these are two examples of, I think, major shifts in, you know. So their view is that it's change is possible, but change happens when internal forces within a country just happen to be aligned in the perfect way. The, and they give these two examples of the glorious revolution in Britain in 1688 and uh, the French Revolution in 1789 as the two examples of where you know you just had the right alignment of forces and then the internal compulsions of the country just drove the country towards good outcomes. That in each case these were just moments of liberation and they did wonderful things for the country. Um, there are many, many other such revolutions, and they've been less successful. I mean, you know, the, um, the Russian Revolution, the Mexican Revolution, the uh, Chinese Revolution, may, there are many others you could go through, and they've been less successful, clearly. So their view is that it's not enough to have revolutions. You need to change societies massively. You need to have revolutions. But revolutions are not easy. Mostly they go wrong. It's only when you have the lucky matching of different forces that you get the right outcome. And therefore, mostly there's not much you can do. You can get lucky. If you get lucky, things will work. If they're not, there's not much you can do about it. And that's very consistent with the view that they have from their, I think, most co their evidence that you know all we really know is that if countries got it right, right several hundred years ago, then that seems to persist. So when good things happen, good things build on each other, but it doesn't, then we have no recipe for creating good things. So that's a very, very, I think, pessimistic, but very, very, and tough-minded, but I think in some ways, admirably, I think, internally consistent point of view. So I'm going to actually argue that lots of institutional changes are possible. That they just they are possible be, uh, at a at a different level from the ones that we are talking about. And so, I guess I'm I I would agree that many things change within countries. Indeed, I would say that if you look at you know status of women, uh, I mean the stunning fact about the world is how much has changed over the last 150 years. Not that there's not a lot of change, and I think it's the change has happened in China uh, as much as it's happened in 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 the U.S. and in China was an extraordinarily, I would say, anti-woman country, and you see massive changes going on. So I, I, I'm going to argue mostly that there is actually lots and lots of possibilities for changing institutions, just that you don't, this is, this is asking a, a different question. So I, I, I guess what we want to argue in the, we argue in the book is most, more, mostly uh, lots of things change. Uh, they don't necessarily change wholesale and you don't necessarily get you know, better institutions in, uh, in any sort of macro sense. But that doesn't mean that things are not changing all the time, even within political systems which are bad. So it, it isn't the case that if you think of, you know, for example, um, very countries which have had very large improvements in education and health. Um, Indonesia under Suharto, which was extraordinarily corrupt, was often rated as the most corrupt country in the world, and was under a, an extraordinarily repressive dictator who at some point is claimed killed a million people 
uh, by labeling them communists in the mid 60s. Um, nevertheless, if you look at what was happening in Indonesia, Indonesia between the period of 1972 and 1990 is one of the world's <coughs> biggest, uh, most successful uh, sort of investors in human capital in the world. I mean, you, you see big changes in education levels, you change, see big changes in uh, health. Uh, Suharto was very, very concerned about the Indonesian health uh, nutrition and he created whole campaign, a, a nationwide campaign of young people going back to villages and te, you know, bringing message of better nutrition and it's claimed to have improved nutrition massively in Indonesia. So this, there is I think, so in other words, I, I think that that's not to say that Indonesia became a better country immediately or that there was no corruption went away. I mean, as in fact, corruption during the same period that education is improving in Indonesia, corruption is also going up. You know, Suharto is becoming more and more corrupt. As his children get older, they're becoming more and more richer, uh, richer and buying up larger and larger shares of the country. So there was not that there was a one-way movement in institutions, and indeed that's my point that this is this is not this is this is there is no sense in which um, there is one institution in place or one set of institutions in place. There are many many things going on in any country, and many of those are getting better, others are getting worse. Uh, you. Uh, I think we're always looking for leverage points where you, what are the best places to, best places to make, uh, make a, you know, a small push and see where we uh, can make a change. So once we start thinking about institutions with, in capital letters, uh, in small letters other than institutions in capital letters, so like not capitalism, but how a specific market is run, we do see lots of changes, and that's the level at which you should, we should think of, of uh, institutional change. Yeah. In some sense, like it seems like you're looking at it from one perspective. You should almost always prefer gradual reform, just because of like all the things that you showed us on the last slide are like so out of sample that like the chances that they'll actually work, just because they're, they're so far beyond what we can observe or test and sort of day-to-day -day, um, things like that, that you would always want to take the path like that the doing gradual reform would be like the passive path of lesser resistance um but then i guess like like you know jim and Jerome and Paul will have this paper where they talk about this thing called the seesaw effect like where you make one dimension of institutions better and another gets worse to compensate or jeff sachs would say that like we need to change everything at once um and i mean do we actually have i i mean i guess the jim and Paul will have a little bit of evidence in their paper, but do we really have much in, in the way of like systematic evidence about this? So I think the answer is no. Uh, I, I, I don't, I, I, so it could be that, you know, uh, you, that they're, they're right, that there is some inevitable, uh, that you can never improve anything without making anything something else worse. I find that implausible, let's say, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that as a, uh, as a, uh, my main point I'm trying to make here is a simpler one, which is that there is no grand theorem which says that every, everything that you can change is determined by some overarching institutional frame. That even within bad institutions, there's lots of things that do change, some for the better, some for the worse, and that, that, that there is enough slack within the system that you can often change things even when things look pretty dire. So here's an example, um, Chinese, in Chinese democracy, this is not well known because you know, China is not supposed to be a democracy. But in fact, China introduced village elections quite early. And it, the, the elections were phased in, so you could, you could compare places which had elections with places which had a centrally appointed village head. So this was just 
um, comparison of what happens to a place when it becomes elected. So you, you ba basically seem to see that uh, you see a, a quite when, when these institutional changes happen in a place like China, which is, after all, not a democracy, huge control of the Communist Party, um, certainly whenever there is any uh, real attempt to change institutions at the high level, it's been stamped out with a great deal of uh, clarity. There's been, never been any sort of debate on, you know, how the, you know, the the challenges to the power of the party have not been entertained. On the other hand, so you might imagine that when China introduces village elections, these would do nothing because you know power has not shifted. Every, this, the same people have power. Um, turns out that when you introduce elections, you get very large changes. And this is not now. This, is, this started, I think, in the 80s. So when you start introducing elections, you get uh, very large changes. Uh, basically, two things happen. One is the central policies that are unpopular are less enforced. So villages, the one-child policy, which is the policy of not allowing people to have more than one child, is relaxed much faster in places which have elections. That's, so somehow, despite the fact that the central government is all-powerful, when the village is, has an election, it does enforce different things. Second, um, one other very important part of Chinese policy is reallocation of farmland. Basically, what they were doing was, you know, uh, they would, for example, take farmland from farmers and build uh, like cities or roads or industrial estates or special economic zones and things like that, and basically. When the village had elected government, that stopped or went down a lot. So you couldn't take land away from the farmers that easily. And this is with the all-powerful state, which, was, which is supposed to have impunity. It was still true that they, you could make many changes within, within that system. And it's so striking how much there seems to be, uh, even in a system like China, how much responsiveness there is to local local uh, demands uh, once you start democracy. So you might have thought that, well, you know, the big institution is there is no democracy in China. That's the, China is classified as a non-democratic state, yet at some level China is actually quite democratic at the local level. And that's sort of a way to understand also why China has sort of managed its um, conflicts relatively effectively is because there is actually pressure valves at the local level which allow it to let off pressure. So there is a, there's a sense in which um, this is not, I think this is an example of why we shouldn't sort of look at on, you know, at institutions from a thousand miles up, but we should look at how they function on the ground a little bit. And uh, I think equally importantly, so, we, I just talked about why bad institutions in capitals, like lack of democracy, doesn't really necessarily always mean there is no democracy on the ground. The opposite is also true, that you could have good institutions, meaning good electoral laws, fair, you know, nominally fair elections, but those elections may actually not be at all fair. And here's a nice example. In Brazil, uh, There was a complicated paper ballot system. So you, you, Brazil has, for the last many years, has had free and fair elections since about the mid 80s. Uh, and yet, in the electro Brazilian electoral system, um, for a long time, people just didn't think about it. So you would have to write in the name of the person who, who, who you were electing, or the number either name or number. You have to say Mr. Seven or something. And since most of the, many people are not very literate, when they write the names of somebody, it is illegible. So as a result, 11% of the names were rejected at any, in any election. 
That's a lot, right? 11% of the votes were rejected. That's a huge amount. So they re basically, this was taking too much effort. Counting votes was too, too complicated. So they basically replaced it with electronic voting, where you had to press a button. So basically, that meant that the invalid votes went away. And as a result, the fraction of, of the elected representatives who were, who were um, uneducated or poor, or less educated or poor, was, went up. The poor were voting for people like themselves. As a result, health expenditures went up. And um, sort of a, a bunch of pro-poor policies were implemented. So this is an example of where Brazil was, had good inst institutions and capitals to start with. But somehow those institutions weren't doing what they were supposed to do. So and if you looked at it from a thousand feet up, you'll see good institutions, but that doesn't mean that the institutions were actually doing what, what they were supposed to be doing. And so about 10% of the population of the, and a huge proportion of the poor were disenfranchised. You know, 11% of the votes were uh, eliminated. That means that you know, if you take the poor, probably 30, 40 percent of the poor were disenfranchised. They didn't, they couldn't vote. That changed the nature of voting and changed the nature of outcomes. So it's sort of, it's a beautiful example of how, you know, something kind of nobody thought about this. It's not that anybody had this as a conspiracy. Uh, this was not somebody's plan. It just was something that was just there. People thought paper ballots are fine. Nobody had thought about it. Once you, once you change the rules, and you mostly change the rules not to fix it, but to just make it easier to count votes, it turned out that that had massive consequences. This is the picture. I'll just skip this. So um, here's, a, here's a, another couple of nice experiments. Um, so, Another sense in another sort of one argument that like Paul Collier makes a lot of is he says, you know, the reason why you have to invade these countries is that these countries are always, they have too much internal conflict. That they can't govern each other themselves because they're fighting each other all the time. He's actually, Paul is very sympathetic to these people. You have to understand, he is a very, very soft hearted. Uh, colonist, colo uh, imperialist. He has, he, uh, you know, uh, I've known him for many, many years, and he's certainly not someone who's cynical about this. This, he's, he certainly does really believe that these people are just they are in caught in this eternal fight against each other. They hate each other's guts, and so therefore they can never govern. Whenever you know one group takes over, it starts beating up on the others. And that's why you always have a permanent state of civil war and conflict. So you, they're just not capable of governing each other because there is so much fundamental hatred of each other. So to look at this, um, uh, uh, Leonard von Chekon, who's a, who's a political scientist from Benin, um, did the following. Uh, Leonard uh, was in the student movement in Benin in the seven, uh, late 70s, early 80s. And that's when Benin was, a, I think Benin had a dictatorship. And so he went to jail with all the other people who were uh, run, you know, leading the student movement. And so he's good, very good friends with all the leading politicians in Benin now. So Benin is now a democracy. And I think, and in the democracy, he's good friends with all the all the leaders. So he basically talked them into doing something quite remarkable. So his idea was, um, let's, he, every leader, he basically cut the following deal. He said, let's go to the area where you are really dominant. Okay. Go to the area where you're really powerful. Okay. So you're never going to lose that area. You're always going to win that area. So it doesn't really matter if you get a little less votes. 
So let's do an experiment where you send different messages in different, uh, con uh, in different uh, areas. Okay, so you, you're going to win within that area. So let's say this, you know, there's this uh, region um, like that, uh, where this is where you're totally dominant. You're always going to win. So now let's chop this up into little pieces and randomly choose some of them. And in some of, this is all within the area where you're sure to win. We're going to, we're going to randomize the message you send. So there are two messages they were sending. So this is the this is the message that sort of is very kind of primes people on on their narrow uh, tribal interest, if you like. This is just says that the Bariba people will get jobs. Okay, we are. I'm the representative of Bar Bariba people. This is what Paul Collier is particularly concerned with. So this is the, the same guy going to different villages and giving uh, different messages. The villages are cho randomly chosen, so you can compare what happens. And they were willing to do it because they were sure of winning. So they, they didn't have to worry about winning there. The question was how much vote, how many votes do they get? This was the message, the clientelist message, the message that will, I'll serve you guys, my people. That's what people are worried about. Here's the public policy message. Same person, different village, goes and delivers this message. Uh, I'm going to, we will fight corruption and promote peace among all ethnic groups in all regions of Benin. Okay, this was completely rigged. He was given, they were given these messages. They, were, uh, they agreed to deliver it because they were friends, friends of his. So this was the this is what makes Paul Collier worried. Okay, so this was the first experiment that Leonard did. So if you look at what happens to vote shares, if you go to the villages where there is you did the public policy message, you got only 59% of the vote. When you did a uh, clientelist message, you got 79% of the vote. So that was the so this is what gets Paul Collier worried. He says people it's not possible to have democracy in these places because people are so narrow-minded. Now, what happened, let me just go back, is uh, okay. Let me see if, where did it go. Okay. Uh, uh, let me mention one more, one, one more, and I'll come back to. No, actually. So let me show you one other experiment before I come to this. This is sort of interesting. To show you one more. So here's an experiment that we did in India, where which is the kind of the opposite of this uh, Wanchigan experiment. So, and has the opposite result. And uh, I'll try and kind of um, interpret why. So th this, uh, so the, in, this is the place, this is probably the most corrupt place in India. Uh, and, uh, about you know, 40 percent of the of the people uh, who are elected from there have criminal charges against it, against them. Okay, in this area, we did an experiment where we randomly chose villages, and in some of the villages, we basically um, showed up with a team of with a puppet show. Basically, we showed up with a puppet show. Uh, the puppet show was to the point of the puppet show was to say. You know, you should not vote based on your caste, which is the equivalent of ethnicity in India. You should vote based on who's who's going to do more development for you. 
So that was the message. It was a completely neutral message. And the, comp and the, and the neutral message is, is uh, you know, was delivered by an NGO. Uh, people, people, uh, if you look at what happened, the people who, who voted based on their, for their ethnic party, went down by a quarter. If you just went and told people, don't do it, they don't do it. So this is sort of the opposite story, which is, you know, in Benin, uh, the experiment was that you went and told people, please vote for me or based on my ethnicity, then they seem to vote on ethnicity. If you tell people, don't vote on ethnicity, do, they do the opposite. Now, is Benin different? I'll come back to that later. But what this made us think about was maybe the reason why you observe this kind of ethnic, ethnicity based voting is not because people are passionate about their ethnic, ethnic roots, sometimes they are, but maybe a lot of people are not, but because they have no other information. Maybe they don't know anything about the candidates and therefore, you know, if I have to, I have no idea who to vote for, there are three people running, I just vote for the one who has the same name as me. Why? Because I have no idea who they are. I've never met them. I have no idea what they believe in. I don't trust them uh, to have told me the truth in any case. So uh, do you actually get uh, the, uh, the uh, do you get the right, right outcome? So, so maybe, maybe the reason why people vote based on ethnicity, whereas we think that this is somehow uh, a kind of uh, people just have some, you know, some biological or sociological hatred of those other people and they can't resist voting. In fact, maybe the reason why they vote for their own ethnicity is only because uh, they have no better choices. They don't know anything about any of the candidates, so they might as well vote for their own ethnicity. So this is what we were investigating. I'll keep going, yeah. I mean, as well, it seemed like it was like a way to target things. Like, I'm this ethnicity, and I'm going to get things for people of this ethnicity, versus I'm going to do good things for you know everybody. Um, right. And I imagine, like, I don't know if that would be so different than if somebody was running for like you know Senate in the U.S. and was like, I'm going to do good things for the people of Massachusetts, versus I'm going to do good things for everyone in the U.S. Like, I mean. That's that. I, I, so you may well be right. So that's another point. But let me let me. I'll come back to the Benin in a minute, because the Benin is, I just want to show this experiment, um, and I'll come back to the Benin one in a minute. So, so based on this idea that maybe voters don't know who, who, who they're voting for, um, and therefore they just vote at random, and maybe they just vote for the guy who has the right name or something, uh, we did another experiment where we gave information about the candidates uh, uh, to the voters. We told them, look, you know, the, this candidate is, I know, m more, ha is more, works harder than that candidate. We showed newspaper printed people's performance and you, and when you do that, you see that people do, do change their voting patterns, suggesting that people don't really know a lot about the candidates. So if you give them information, they react, which suggests that information is valuable to them. They don't really know what's going on. Okay, let me now uh, go back to Benin and I'll come back to this. So here's what happened in Benin. One chicken did a second experiment. Second experiment was instead of people just saying, I'm going to do good for everybody. He actually had them run a conference where they, in the conference they discussed real policies. Okay, so they had a long discussion of real substantive policies. Experts were invited and some policies and, and so parties took up the policies that were, came out of that conference and put it on their platform. These were well worked out policies, not claims about I'll do good for everybody. So the, the only difference, they will, then he does the same experiment as before. In a different election, 
later election, he does the same experiment, which is telling some people, you know, here's, here's um, uh, you know, either send an ethnic message or a non-ethnic message. Okay. And now, when you go and tell I'm going to do good for everybody, that actually goes the other way. So when you say I'm going to do good for everybody, but it's backed with a real policy proposal, you get much more positive results. So it looks like the voters were actually rightly cynical about these politicians. They were claiming they're going to do stuff for you know, everybody, but nobody believed them because they had not put any content into it. When you actually put content into what you are claiming, voters react very differently. They, they feel like you know, there's some, something that's going on that's maybe worth supporting. So you see, instead of this you know, strong reaction for the ethnic point of view, now you get the opposite, which is a strong reaction for the non-ethnic point of view. OK, let me talk. So, Another example, I mean, so the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, it's easy to, that in some sense what looks like sort of structural resistance to any change, says, you know, countries are just hopeless, they have such ethnic conflict that they can't do anything about it. That might be true under some situations, but I mean, for example, uh, if you if you take a country, if you want to name countries which have had um, some of the most, I think, most serious ethnic violence in the last uh, 20 years, uh, they include many countries which are actually very economically successful countries. I mean, uh, so it's not clear that that's something that's actually that that strongly um, is that the effects are that strong. But even if you believe it, it's not clear whether ethnic conflicts are a result of other failures or, a, or the cause. So in other words, is it the case that people are basically cynical about the political system and therefore they vote for you know, just about the person whose name is the same as theirs? Or are they, is it really the case that uh, they, are, they vote for people, uh, people who have the same name as theirs, and therefore the political system fails. I mean, that, that's sort of the challenge in figuring out. And uh, at least there seems to be some data which suggests that, I mean, this, this evidence that I've been talking about suggests that it may well be that to a certain extent, if people are cynical about the political system, makes them then vote more unreliably, and if you could actually get the political system to be more effective, then people would actually be less inclined to vote on, this, on the ethnic basis. So in other words, I'm trying to make the case that uh, what looks like, if you, if you like, in Collier's view, the fundamental problem is ethnic hatred. Whereas eth it may well be that the fundamental problem is just economic failure and ethnic hatred is, or ethnic conflicts are just a result of that. And it's not clear which way that goes. Um, and in particular, it could be very innocent. People just are completely, it's not that they hate anybody, they just think, okay, well, you know, if I don't have any information, I'm gonna vote for the guy who has the same name as me. That might be a significant part of what is called ethnic voting. Um, here's another uh, instance uh, is interesting. So go, going down the same path of, of making the point that, um, that uh, you, you, it is possible to, that it is possible. So in other words, so far what we've been, I made two points. One is that Having good institutions is no guarantee that you get uh, good outcomes. And the good institutions at the 
you know, at the thousand feet level is not a guarantee that you good good outcomes on the ground level. And conversely, having what bad outcomes, if you look at from a thousand feet, what looks like bad outcomes may not be necessarily some things that you should just take as well. You know, it's not possible to do anything in this country. There may be lots of slack in the country because, for example, even ethnic preferences, which is sort of seen as a fundamental constraint, may not be that much of a constraint. They may just be an outcome rather than a constraint. To, to pursue that point that, you know, even uh, that it's often possible to have um, substantial changes uh, even when the economic incentives have not been changed very much. So, you know, the, the structures of power have not changed, the institutions are the same. Here's an example. Um, this is not so much saying whether the institutions are good or bad to start with, but to say that you know, you can, it's possible to change institutions at the margin a little and get big effects. So here's an example from Brazil. Brazil has this, uh, Brazil is interesting, the political system in Brazil is among the most interesting in the world. One thing they do is every month 60 municipalities are chosen at random and their accounts are audited. So you, you audit, audit, audit the accounts and then the audits are basically, these are, there's a lottery, literally, that's on TV. <laughs> They're doing a lottery, it's not, not to declare the winner of the, of the lottery doesn't get a lot of money, the winner of the lottery gets audited. So you don't want to be the winner, okay? So, mm. It's on TV, so it's very, very transparent. Everybody can see that it's, it's really a lottery. That's a big advantage of lottery. Um, the audit results are given to the government and disclosed to the media. So um, there's a nice paper studying the effect of these audits. And basically what they do is they compare places that were audited just before the election and places that were audited just after the elections. So like elections um, and in particular, uh, it turns out that, so if you look at the average effect of being audited uh, before or after elections, it's not a big difference. Why isn't there a big difference? Well, turns out most people don't find out the results. But if you look at the places which have a radio, which have a radio station and compare the places, the effect of being audited on places which have a radio station with effect of not being audited on places which have a radio station, you see a massive effect. People who are, uh, if you're corrupt and you were, you were a mayor from a place that had a radio station, and you were audited before the election, you are 25 percentage points less likely to, uh, less l likely to get elected than if you were from, uh, from a place where you were, you were a non-corrupt mayor from a place which has a radio station and which was audited uh, before the election. So if the difference in election probability uh, if you, so what we're doing here, we're comparing places that were elected where, the, we're comparing places that were audited before the election and after the election, and we're comparing good mayors with bad mayors. So if good mayors are much more likely to get elected in places where the audit was before the elections than, uh, whereas there's little difference between good mayors and bad mayors, when, if the audit was to happen after the election. So just this act of just publishing the audits seems to have substantially changed the incentive for corruption in Brazil. So this is something that, this is not an, this is an example of something where the system has not changed. The whole system is the, still the same. Brazilian democracy has not changed a lot. But just the, the fact that they instituted these audits means you know, being corrupt is much more costly. Here's a 
this is the picture uh, which makes that point. Um, if you look at the blue is uh, those who got elected, the audit was after the election and being corrupt has no effect on your re-election rate. Whereas if you had zero, uh, if you was, had zero uh, corrupt violations and you were, uh, you were, uh, you had a pre-election audit, you were uh, 35 percentage, I said 25, 35 percentage points less likely to be elected than you if you had three or more. So if there was a pre-election audit, if you post-election audit, it doesn't matter because you know the election's done. So getting information has huge effects here. I mean these effects are of a magnitude which are like this is, I mean clearly, you know, you go from having a, you know, a 50 percent chance of being elected to being a 20 percent chance of being elected just when you publish the results. Um, so again, making the point that small changes in the institutional frame, the little institutions, changing them a little might actually give you big effects. Finally, let me talk about a this doesn't mean, so I want to, so so far what I've been trying to say is, is a bit that even within bad institutional frames or without changing the institutional frame more generally, you can make good things happen. That doesn't mean that good things are guaranteed to happen. Whenever you try things, good things happen. That's not at all what I'm saying. So I'm saying that what's, what's true about the economy at the thousand feet level is entirely um, sort of one thing and then there is possibly what ha what's relevant at the 10 feet level and those things are only weakly correlated. So it's not, so in other words, things fail at the ground level whether or not you have good institutional structures. So let me give you the example, an example of where the, the institutional structures were all kind of good and the, and the system completely failed. So we did an experiment where there was a district administration in, in India uh, work with an NGO to set up a monitoring system to, to make sure that nurses come to work. Nurses often don't come to work. Uh, you saw that I think at the beginning of the semester with Esther. And um, this is a big concern for the health system because you know you show up, nobody's there, that's not so good. Um, so the way it was implemented was that there was a date and time stamp given to every nurse. This was just on Mondays when she was required to be in the center. She was required to stamp her presence on something that was stuck to the wall. So she would have to stamp it there so that you know people could she would have, people could check whether she was there or not. So she had to stamp it on the wall, so she had to be there, basically. And this NGO was in charge of collecting the stamps and making, and counting them up and giving it to the government. The government was announced um, a kind of a, so the district administration was very, taking this very seriously. They announced that anybody who doesn't come to work more, you know, at least 50 percent of the time will get fired basically. So there was a quite major top down attempt to reform. So this was kind of the, you know, the institutional frame was doing everything it needed to do. So when this was announced immediately, uh, you just compare the, the dashed lines to the dashed lines. I'll, I didn't tell you the story of the solid line. So just as compare the uh, dash line to the dash line, you see that there's a m very major uh, effect. At the beginning, the, uh, the presence of the nurse goes from 15 percent, 15 percent, I mean they don't show up at all, to about 55 percent, goes up massively. When you announce this program, it goes up massively, 
they start to come to work. And that's not surprising. You told them, you know, and then what happens, you see those curves that are getting closer and closer, and they finally cross. So I, after a while, it turns out that if you tell in the places where, where the nurses were threatened with losing their jobs, they're coming to work less than where they were not threatened. So what happened? Why did it get reversed? So what happened was very interesting. So two things happened. The nurse has an immediate boss whose job is to decide whether the nurse needs to come to work or not. Why? Because the nurses have things like training. So some days they're not required to come to work. Those are called exempt days. And then there's the, the date and time stamp had to work in order to monitor the nurses. So if the stamp, date and stamp, time stamp got broken, you couldn't monitor them. Now there was a rule which said that you know, if it's broken, they would have to bring it into the center and get it replaced. But still, you know, once it gets broken, it's less easy to monitor them. So what happened was very simple. Um, absence did not go up. It's not that the absence went up, the exemptions went up. Meaning that their immediate boss basically declared, fine, you don't have to come to work. Now on, you're not absent, you're exempt. So meaning the bo boss said basically, I don't care if you don't come to work. So I'll give you an official excuse to not come to work. That was part of what happened. Part of what happened was that they started breaking the machines. The machines started breaking in increasing frequency. And the bosses who should have complained about that didn't complain. So it was the machines kept broke, breaking and nobody was objecting. So uh, things were basically the whole program collapsed. Now, why, why, why did this happen? Is so cl clearly uh, this was a result of the fact that the uh, the nurse and her immediate boss were co colluding. That's not surprising. But the reason why it actually happened was not because the institutional frame was bad. In some sense. There is democracy, there, is a, there was a supervisor who wanted it to happen, there was an NGO that was implementing it. The reason why it didn't work was mostly because there was no, there was no demand for it to work. That it wasn't, it wasn't so much that the institutional frame wasn't there, it was just that the, basically people figured out that if it didn't work, nobody would complain. And why would nobody complain? Well, you saw this before, Nobody ever showed up in these health centers, in any case. So there was no one to complain. So there was no political compulsion to, fi to fix it. And that meant that at some level, uh, there was no, no pressure to make it work. Uh, this is what we sometimes, we call, uh, so we call triple I. Or, that the whole system, the, in other words, the reason why this intervention didn't work is not because the institutional frame was not working, but because there was no one on the ground who actually wanted it, had any stake in making it work. The, the people who were, when, nobody went to the health center, so nobody complained. Uh, nobody, the, the system was designed with the idea that these nurses have some internal desire to serve the people. So the so sort of system has no effective culture of making sure that the nurses uh, want to come to work. It's sort of, they never invested in it. And finally, uh, the, uh, there was no one had thought about the fact that, uh, no one had thought about the fact that, uh, then you know that the, 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 the there was these exempt days 
and that these exam days were not regulated. So there was, it was mostly just the fact that you know, when this intervention was introduced, nobody had actually put enough thought into, into what, what the nurses, how the system would react. And so it was, it was not so much that the institutional frame was particularly bad here, uh, you know, other interventions do work. It's just that this was a system where uh, there was no, no one who actually had thought about how to design an intervention to, that, uh, that would work, and therefore it didn't work. Indeed, uh, we, when we went back, we figured out why you get this crossing. Why do you think we get this crossing? Why did you think the nurses came less where they were incentivized to come? They realize that their bosses are very willing to collude with them to not let them work. Uh, this is a, and because they were very willing to do that, uh, so because they had had a policy which required their bosses to enforce, the firm, now they could learn that the bosses had no interest in enforcing. Before this, they didn't know that. So in the control villages, they don't yet know that the bosses don't care. In the treatment villages, they really learned that the bosses don't give a damn whether they come to work or not, so they stop coming to work. So all of this is not, to, so making the point that it's not that we, that there is the fact that the institutions, sort of whether the institutions work, the institutions at the thousand feet level work or don't work, I mean there's democracy here, everywhere, lots of people vote, there is political competition, all of those things that are supposed to make these things work are all present. The reason why it doesn't work is, is simply at the micro level, the incentive to make it work isn't there because you know, people don't go to the health center, so nobody actually demands that the health centers work. No. The, uh, basically, people have checked out of the system, so more people use the health center, but only by accident. When it's open, so the probability per day, more people are not present. It's, it's open more often, but it doesn't have any effect on who gets treated. Yeah, per cap, per day. Yeah, Alisa. I mean, the fact that nobody is using these can't be that there wouldn't be a demand for healthcare if they function into itself an outcome. Absolutely, but you cannot fix, but this attempt to fix it was, came from a bureaucratic impulse which said that, you know, have health center, will make it work. And they just did not think about what, what requir was required to make it work, which is to get a demand for it, otherwise it's never going to work. The political system only provides incentives for things people want. If people don't want it, the political system doesn't provide incentives. So, it, got, it was a classic example of, a, of, of trying to fix institutions uh, without really having understood how the institutions work. Okay, so I'll continue with this next time. <laughs>